and looking how our code links to the other resources in the application. Really most of the time that we're going to spend in this course is going to be on the code. All right, because once we understand how the um, resources work, um, it's not, I don't know, I'm not saying it's easy or straightforward, but once you have that down, you know, it's just more of the same, you know. Um, but really where things get interesting is the where these components talk to each other. And what brings things together is your code, specifically your activity and the other classes that you have. Let me bring up Eclipse, where we left off last time, and just spend a second looking at the other resources, and then spend more time looking at the, what do I want to call it? the actual code. All righty. Just to review as we take our tour around these, manifest has information about the application. Resources, so far we've seen three different kinds of resources, the drawable, the layout, and the values. The drawable contains graphics. And the drawable will nearly always have resource qualifiers attached to it because we want to have different versions of the icon. So at the very least, you want to have different versions of the icon in those three. The different versions depend on, or three or four, however many. The, the different versions of the icon, again, are qualified by the density of the device. So that allows the icon to be approximately the same size regardless of what the density of the device is. All right. High density is a bigger file, low density is a smaller file, but they both translate into the same physical size on a device. Um, values is where we put our string and other constants. And last but not least, our layout is in an XML file that defines the different views. Every little component on the UI is called a view. All right. Um, views are contained within layouts. The layouts describe the manner in which the views are next to each other. The, um, the views then, there's a view for text, there's a view for edit text, there's a spinner, and, and so on and so forth. All right. I imagine we're pretty clear on that. We've gone over that, I think, each of the first two days. Um, and we started to look at the code, which I will take and review some of the stuff that we went over last time. First of all, the package that it is in, that's when you create the application. That's a way of identifying your code and putting it in a package. And a goal is you want to make sure it's unique. And you really want to make sure it's unique worldwide. All right, because the whole promise of Java is you could integrate with other components and so on and so forth. And it would hate to, if you found a really good framework and someone used the exact same package name as yours, then it would be able to, it would be impossible to differentiate between your classes and their classes. By using this technique of using the reverse URL, we can guarantee that. Um, there is only one edu, lorraineccc.edu. So by making the class name start with ed, edu, lorraineccc, no one else should have that worldwide other than folks here at LC. And then within a larger organization, you might have divisions or whatever, and you could break that down further. 
Imports, we can import the different classes that we are going to use. And we say where they exist within the Android framework. This helps you by, you don't have to type the entire package name and class name when you use a class then. You can just put the package name, and when, or I'm sorry, the, uh, the, the class name. And in, like in the case here where I say activity, all right, by virtue of the fact that we've imported Android app activity, the compiler knows that by activity they mean you mean this particular class. As opposed to some other activity class that might exist in another package. You know, if you were a uh, after school program, you might have a class for activities that your students did or something like that. Well, how do we know which class we want. Well, by importing it, we know, hey, this is a class we want. We want the activity classes in the Android app package that's part of the uh, Android framework. We spent a little bit of time talking about a couple of object-oriented things, and I want to review these because these are, um, these can be confusing depending on how much specific OO stuff you've had. Um, you've all had the intro to C-sharp, is that correct? Have any of you had the advanced C-sharp? So a smattering. I understand you get a lot more in object-oriented stuff in that class. So hopefully some of these things will, um, um, we can cover at least to the level where you can um, do it here. I do it in this class. And if you take the C-sharp class, some of those concepts, or if you take my Java class, some of those con uh, concepts will be covered more thoroughly. We have a class that extends activity and implements another interface, view on click listener. Okay, what does that mean? Extending is inheritance. When we say that this class extends another class, we mean that this class inherits from that class. Uh, another way to put it is this class, my example activity, is a subclass of activity. Or activity is a superclass for example activity. Superclass means it's sort of a parent on the, on the inheritance chain. What does it mean when we say something inherits from another class? It means it has everything that class has. All the attributes, all the methods, plus we can add some new stuff to it. Plus, we can override some stuff. All right. Um, the example I gave, you know, um, when we talk about animals, there are certain characteristics that all animals do. There are certain characteristics that all mammals do. And then there are some things that are distinct to humans. Only humans get driver's licenses, for example. So we do everything mammals do, but we can get driver's licenses and enroll in classes and so on. Yes? Yes. Well, it depends. Private methods, no. Um, protected methods, it includes. That's right. I forgot about that. It does not include private, but it would include protected. What do you mean there would be a property for it? Okay. I think you mean the exact opposite. It is a good idea to make your, your, your properties or your attributes private and then have another way, have a method to set those. Yeah. A, get set. a get set. A get set is a method that goes and sets the value of a property. So, okay, okay. right. But yes, uh, to answer your original question, that does not include private, but it does include protected. That being said, that being said, I'm sure if you called a method, I couldn't call the private method 
from within the subclass. But if I called a public method on the class and that public method called the private method on the superclass, that would be okay. I would guess. So parent method called mom has a private method called child and parent couldn't call couldn't call the method direct, but if it called if someone else called a method on the child that was inherited from the mom class and as part of that mom class it called the private method, that would be okay. All right. These are kind of edge cases. I wouldn't worry too much about them. Uh, if you run into a situation where you need it, uh, try it. See what happens. <laughs> All right. So when we say it extends, it means an inheritance. It means it gets everything that that class has. So all the attributes that are defined on an activity exist on my activity, this example activity. All the methods that exist on activity exist on mine, plus I can override them. So I've overridden one of those methods here, onCreate. There is a onCreate method on the superclass. There's an onCreate method on activity. All right, that's part of the framework. I don't know what that is, but there's a method there. I am overriding it, though. All right, so I define the same method. The first thing I do, though, is I call the parents method. So that way I get to do everything the parent does, plus I can do some extra things. Because if you override a function, it replaces the function. If I didn't do this line, there's some setup on the parent class. There's some code that does some setup on the parent's class that I wouldn't have executed. That probably wouldn't be a good thing. Things probably would break if I did that. All right. And you can look. You can go in. If you go and search for Android activity you can see what is on an activity. You can see all the properties and methods. It's good if you get familiar with developerandroid.com and the reference and what are sometimes called the Java docs or the documentation of this. It shows you the inheritance of this because activity itself inherits from a few things. There are some subclasses from it. <coughs> then there are some methods that exist that most of the time will be overridden. <coughs> says here are any of these methods you should call the super first. Here's a list of the methods that exist in activity. We are only we only overridden over we have only overridden the one, the on create. Here's a list of the methods that exist that we could override. And when they get run, and so on and so forth. There's also a list of attributes probably somewhere. If we scroll down. Here we go. This is what I wanted. Here are some attributes, some things it inherits. These are some constants associated with it. 
some fields associated with it, and a list of methods. It's good to get used to reading this documentation. So if you have questions about this, that, or the other, you can look it up here and like find what's the attribute that does this, what's the attribute that does that. I point this out because there's not a lot of code in my activity, but there's a lot of stuff that goes on in the framework that's handled for me. And that's where it happens. All right. All those great things I said about like picking the right resource file and using the one XML file if it's a French, another XML file if it's English. All those great things that happen, happen somewhere. We don't have to write them. Well, where they happen is somewhere up that inheritance chain of all the ancestors of activity. And our activities get that behavior for free. All right, we don't have to code that. We do, however, have to write or on create to tell it what to do when the application fires off. All right, so that's inheritance. The other important concept is implements. And you don't implement a class, you implement an interface. An interface consists of only abstract functions. Is that meaningful to anyone, what an abstract function is? An abstract function is where you have a signature of a function, a name of it, and arguments, but there's no code for it. When I say a class implements it, it means that it has all of the functions that are defined in that interface. So, in our case, we're talking about view on click listener. Guess how many functions are defined on that? Six? One. How do we know there was only one? Well, we only implemented one. All right? We have to implement all of the methods that exist in an interface anytime we implement an interface. So we can sort of backwards think and say, well, this one we already said comes from the activity class. We're extending that. We're overriding that. So this must be the class, or I'm sorry, this must be the method that is required to implement that. So when we say it implements an interface, that's a promise, all right, between us and the compiler. We promise the compiler any methods defined on that interface, we will define in our class, all right? A concrete function, an abstract function, we'll define an actual method. When we promise that, that means that we can plug in that class anywhere where a member of that interface is required. All right? So in this case, I'm implementing the on click listener. That means I can use this class, example activity, I can use this class anywhere where an on click listener is required. Because I've lived up to the contract. I've lived up to my promise of implementing all of the, all of the um, methods that are on the on-click interface. Let me just show you, if I don't do that, let me comment that out. Can't remember if I did this last time or not. What's that? Yes. Right. But that's not a loophole. No, it's not. It, but, but by technicality, you have to use every function. No. I, I think what you're doing is you're confusing inheritance 
and and implements. Oh, okay. So in other words, interface A can inherit from interface B. And then I could only override some of the methods in interface A. All right? Because I inherited the rest of them. However, I could not say interface A, or I couldn't say interface B implements interface A. All right? So that's, I think, where the confusion comes into. Something can implement more than one interface. Exactly. You can only extend one thing, but you can implement as many interfaces. Because all you're doing is you're promising that you're going to have the right number of methods. I don't think so. I, um, I, these are kind of edge cases, but I, I don't think so. You define it as, 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 define something as an interface, and then you implement that. Um, what you would do, like for example, getting back to the flying creatures, you know, and, and things like that. We could um, have our bird class, which extend animal. Why? Because a bird is an animal. Fundamentally, that's what a bird is, you know, if you think about it. But we could say that it implements the flying thing interface. And it implements the thing with feathers interface. All right? And that would, it would, you know, other things, pillows, down jackets, and so on, could implement the feathers one, and kites, and airplanes, and helicopters could implement the flying thing ones. So all an interface is is a promise that whatever method's defined for that interface, this guy has it. This class has it. Because then you can plug it into anywhere where a member of that interface is required, and it can do the job. It has a method for it. Yes. Yes, you cannot implement a class. Yeah, you, you can implement a class. Can you extend an interface? I think so. You just can't implement a class. Correct. And I don't think, yeah, and, and I think you need a class to implement an interface. No, this is Java. This is an Android. And this, this again, is, is OO terminology. And multiple inheritance is messy. So that's why almost no language supports it. Well, you see... Well, this is Java code, and as you can see, it does not use. I know. I just, I, I'm not yeah. Not okay. All right. Yeah, no, no, extends is the same thing as in, inheritance. So, again, notice what happens when I count out that method, by the way. That's the more important part. We get an error. It tells us that the type example activity must implement the, inherit, the inherited abstract method view on cl uh, click listener dot on click. What that's telling me is I promise this could be an on click listener. In other words, I promise that any method that exists on the on click listener interface, I'm implementing it here. I have a, a, a version of that method here. But when I comment it out, I don't have it anymore. So every, every method. And there's only one. Exactly. Well, a flying thing. All right. A flying thing can do what? A flying thing has a maximum height. A flying thing has a speed. So on a flying thing interface, I could have get maximum height, get maximum speed. Well, yeah, those sound more like classes to me. Um, let's see. Um, 
I'll give you one. I'll give you a real Android one. Because again, I can give you these contrived ones, but you're thinking like, you know, whoever writes an application that tells, you know, um, how fast any flying thing is. All right. Um, the, uh, if I'm not mistaken, and it's been a while since I looked at the exact code, but if you do a, if you implement the um, touch on touch detection on a, on a screen, yeah, there are several methods you have to implement. You have to implement the touch, you have to implement the swipe, you have to implement the double touch, and you have to implement the long touch. So there's four methods on that one that you have to implement. So if you have a class that's going to listen for that, it has to listen to all these. Now, you could write code to ignore it, all right, but you have to acknowledge that, hey, I know that that method exists and I'm going to implement it. And it would do nothing, right? Yes. Yes, you have to you have to have one of each method that's defined in the interface. All right. So we effectively said that this activity, in addition to being an activity, is going to serve the role of the on-click listener for the button. In other words, this class is going to contain the code that gets executed when the button is clicked. It doesn't have to be that, that way. Okay? Doesn't have to be that way. I could have another class. I could define, you know, there's a, a few different ways and we'll see different examples of that. In this case, this is probably the most straightforward way. You know, that way I only need the one class. The one class is the activity, and it's serving the role as the code that executes when the button gets clicked. So, in our override, we call the ancestors um, on create. We set the content view. What that says is make the XML file that's called main.xml and r.layout, make that the view on the screen. All right. This then is a key, key, key statement, and we spent some time looking at it last time. Button calc equals button find view by ID r dot id dot calc. Okay. What this does is this. Let's let's work backwards here. R ID calc. Well, if we look at the XML for the layout. If we look at the XML for the layout, <clears throat> that's this button here. Because we have in the XML for Android ID equals at plus ID calc. In other words, create a new ID for this guy and call that ID calc. That's what the plus means. We're creating a new ID. We're not referencing some old ID like we do elsewhere. doesn't have to be in this order, no. Sure. Yeah, I'll buy that. At least, at the, at the very least, be consistent. Yeah. You know, uh, different places have different policies. At any rate, this button has an ID called calc. So, Can two students have the same ID? No. No. The whole idea of an ID is that it identifies. All right? So if it could point to two things, that's not really identifying. Because then which one do you mean? All right. Um, this says find view by ID. Where does that method live? I don't have a find view by ID method in here. Pardon me? It exists in the framework. It exists in one of the superclasses of activity. You'd have to go back to see exactly which one it is. But again, remember we extended this activity from 
we extended my example activity from activity. And by virtue of that, we get all the methods that exist in all those subclasses, all, I'm sorry, all those superclasses. And one of them somewhere is find view by ID. What does find view by ID do? If anyone has ever done jo uh, JavaScript, it's very similar to like document get element by ID. In other words, take that ID and point to the thing that has that ID. All right? Now, in this case, we know that it's that button. Why? Well, because we created that GUI and we gave it that ID. So we know it's pointing at the button. So this instruction will point to a button. It will point to a view. In our case, we know it's a button. Because we know it's a button, we can tell the compiler, yeah, by the way, that's a button. Store it in a button variable. All right? Find view by ID does exactly that. It doesn't find a button by ID or an image view or a text or anything like that. It finds whatever view has that ID. All right? Now, that's all well and good. That's useful. It finds it. But for us to do button-like things to it, for us to treat it in our code like a button, we have to tell the compiler, hey, by the way, this is a button. All right? What would happen if it wasn't a button? If I use the wrong ID, for example, and I put the ID of a text box in there? No. It'll yell at you. When will it yell at you? Okay. It will yell at you, not compile. All right. There's two kinds of errors that exist, at least two kinds of errors. There is syntax or compile errors where you did something wrong. All right. I didn't know that it was find view by ID, so I used get view by ID. All right. Those are the good kind of errors to get because you're going to get those squiggly lines and it tells you right away, hey, you did that wrong. All right? So, yeah, those are the kinds of errors you want to get. So your compiler will take care of that and it won't compile, it won't go any further. Now, an error like this, we know that it's a button because we did it. The compiler really doesn't know it's a button it doesn't really know that it's a button until it goes and tries to execute it. So when it tries to execute it, it will say, hey, all right, I got this button here. And it will find view by ID, and it will find, let's say, a text box. And look, and it'll say, oh, wait a minute, that's not a button. That is a text box or whatever. So you try to treat a text box or something like a button, it's going to blow up at you. But it's going to blow up at runtime and not at compile time. Because the compiler doesn't know that it's wrong. Doesn't know that you lied to it until it tries to do it. All right? So. When we're done with this instruction, calc contains a variable that points to that button object. So wherever we use the word calc, we are referring to that button. All right. Next line, we say calc set on click listener to this. Well, what is this in that statement? Yeah, it's whatever class that that code appears in. So this is, a pair, this is relating to the object of type example activity. So, in other words, this activity. In English, what is this saying? All, right, well, all those things are pretty well accurate. Another way to say it is this class contains the code that gets executed when this button named calc gets clicked. All right? So the argument to this set on click listener is the 
object that's going to handle the clicking of that button. It is the object that has the onClick event which handles the clicking of the button. And what class handles that? Well, this class, this class, remember, does two things. It serves the role of being the activity, and it's also serving the role as the button click handler, all right, button click listener. So what this does is this says, hey, this class itself contains the onClick event, onClick method, that's going to get called when that button gets clicked. All right? Yes? No, if you were to eliminate that line, then nothing would happen when the button got clicked. Like if you if you didn't if you didn't like if you just like comment that out or whatever, right, nothing would happen. Yes. In general, on click listener, does mm -hmm. it listen for any first clicks on certain views? It's listening for a click on a view, correct. Repeat that, please. On click listener, listen for click on views, correct? Yes. So if you have code added to this for not just this button, but say a text box or something, and mm -hmm. you click the text box, it'll do something for every code? You would have to assign that on click listener to the text box. Yes. Okay. All right. So it's not just the button. Right. It's whoever you assign it to. All right whatever view you assign it to. So you could, you could do a thing where like you click an image, let's say, and a bigger image appears. All right? Then you'd have an on-click method, not on a button, but on, uh, on, a, on an image. Yep. Right. Okay. What do we have here? Yes? What did you have to leave if you took out this? If I took out this, I would get a compile error because you have to give it something there. You have to give it, you have to say the class that is going to, that contains the code that's going to process the clicking of it. So if I left out that, it would be uh, a compile error. Like if I did th that, gives me an error because this function set on click listener which is defined for a view all right not just buttons again but a view a button is a view all right so it inherits this requires uh, an argument can I put a class name there no I can put an object there I can put an object that to define that this object handles the clicking. But I could put the name of another object there, provided I had created it and it implemented the onClick listener and it had the onClick method. All right. What happens when we click this? All right. First of all, this onClick method is defined as part of our activity because we're implementing that interface. And this is a code that's going to happen when the button gets clicked. This method gets past the view. All right? In other words, we could test this variable v as part of the framework that that variable v contains specifically which view got clicked. So, in other words, we could use the, possibly use the same on-click on listener for uh, a number of buttons if we wanted to or a number of different things, all right? Because that view says, this is the guy that got clicked, all right? That's an argument to this method, correct. Well, view v is defined as an argument. So, yeah, view v... Now, what you might be asking is, where? yeah, well, the framework handles that to pass in. When it calls the onClick method, it passes in the view that got clicked. That's okay. part of, yeah, that's part of the framework. Right. We have up here, these first three statements, 
are pretty much identical to what we did with the button with the exception that we're not looking at buttons, we're looking at edit text fields, text view, and spinner controls. All right. So in all three of those cases though, we're grabbing them using their ID. Those match the ID in the XML file. All right. And we are telling the compiler, yeah, we know that, that that's not just any view, that's an edit text view. That's not any view, that's a text view. That's not any view, that's a spinner. So we cast the view that it finds to the proper data type. Then we can treat it to that data type. All right. Then we can add the options on the spinner control or whatever we want to do. All right. I create a variable for cost and I get that by parsing the edit text field get text to string. All right. So what that does effectively is it converts the contents of that text box to a double. Yes. Bill's parse it will throw an exception. All right. Repeat that, please. Correct. Yeah. If 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 for example, you know, we put in um, you know someone's name at that point, it would blow up and it'd be done. Um, I'm not testing for exceptions here because A is early in the semester. We haven't covered all that stuff yet. All right. And B, if you remember, my UI only allows numbers to be put in there. So I'm pretty safe for that. That being said, I would still go and put the exception trapping around it. But again, it's early in the semester. I initialize this percentage variable. And I set the percentage variable based on, actually I don't need this line, based on the value of the selected item position. The selected item position is what? It's the position of the spinner that was chosen. So if I chose the first option, that selected item position as a value of zero. If I chose the second option, it would have it as one. If I chose the third option, it would have a value of two. All right. So when I'm done here, that percentage is going to have one of these three values, right? Because those are the only values that um, um, that are in the in the, the spinner control. I do the calculation of taking the cost and multiplying it by the percentage. All right. Then I take that result, flip it to a string, and stuff it back into the text view. I think I left my Android device upstairs. So I'm going to ask you in a few minutes the question. Realizing that this is a simple app, all right, what are some ways, what, what, what's wrong with the code that I have? And let's forget things like I should do exception trapping, I should probably have validation and all of those kinds of things, or that the UI is ugly or, or stuff like that. On a conceptual level, how could we improve this app? I'm going to go up and grab my Android device and I'll be back down. So discuss that for a minute. While I go and do that. Yes. Are there else's to the dog? There's else's, yeah. There might even be an else if, but I find else ifs confusing. So I just use else's. And again, in my opinion, clear code is better than having a 56 nested if statement that you have to trace through what it could be wrong. No, yeah, it's a little redundant.
Double, and put, another way to put it, is double, notice that D starts with a lowercase. What does that tell you about? That it's a variable, it's a primitive. It's not, of course it's a variable, but it's a primitive, is what I meant to say. So a primitive is only a value. So there are no methods associated with a primitive. All right? If they have methods, they're not a primitive, right. So that's why. Right? So is what John said that if the primitive is not changed? No. What I would do is if I want to say multiple, where the percentage variable is added, I would have just Wow, I should, I, should, I should let you guys grade my stuff if you're going to take off for that small of an issue. I mean, I would give, I can only say what I would do differently, not necessarily. Well, let me ask a question, all right, that, that will point you in the right direction. I'm doing a what? A calculation on this. Yeah. This yeah, I am. But anyway, sorry, go ahead. All right. How does this code execute? Or rather, when does this code execute? When the, button. when the button is clicked. What if I had somewhere else in my app that I wanted to do this code? Uh, the bottom line is here, I'm, I'm out of luck. All right? Because this has processing code. This has, if you will, and a Granted, it's simple, but it has business logic that lives in the activity, and specifically it lives in the click handler. So that means that the only place I could ever call this would be 
when the button is clicked. Well, there might be other times I want to call it, right? Maybe I want to call it, um, I don't know, maybe I want to have a super simple tip calculator that doesn't even have the um, doesn't even have the spinner control, just assumes that you got average service. All right? Or maybe I wanted to, like I talked about in the Java class, for those of you that are in that, print out a tip table that if it's this amount and the service was poor, ec uh, average, excellent, these or that. The bottom line is you don't want business logic tied to UI stuff. More or less, yeah. All right. And in other words, when I look at this, this activity has two, has a few things in it. All right. It handles the UI. Right. It goes and it sets the main screen. It tells what happens when you click the button. And it looks at the text box does the calculation and puts the answer in there. So it's sort of the glue that glues my processing to the UI, but it also has business logic in it. As a general rule, you want your event handlers, your event listeners, to not contain business logic. Why? Because if that's where it lives, that's the only place you can use it. Yes? Some variables it's okay to declare an error, but all of them probably not. All right. So we're gonna we're gonna move in a direction here of separating out this code. We're gonna do it like in a couple passes. All right. First thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get the code out of the event handler, and I'm just gonna create a method inside the activity class, my my main activity class that does the calculation. Then at the very least, within this activity, I could call it from a couple different places if I needed to. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a method public. I suppose I could make this private because this is the only guy that's going to be using it, but we'll make it public to start. What's next? Next is the return value. What was my tip calculation going to return? A double. I'm going to say public double. Uh, I've got to give the function a name. Calc tip or tip calc, doesn't really matter. What arguments do I need to supply this? All right. I need the level of service and I need the, um, the bill. Thank you. So, repeat please. Well, I'm going to pass a zero, one, or two. At this point, yes. All right. So these are the only things that this needs to do its job. All right. So. I'm going to go and copy all this stuff here for now. And
let's look at this. I think that is correct. All right, public double. Public means the outside world can access it. Really doesn't matter too much at this point because our whole world is just this one class anyhow, so <laughs> we're not really too concerned about that. Double, double is a return type. That's what this guy returns. It returns a double. Calc tip is the name of the method. It, ex it expects two arguments. A double for arg level and a double for arg bill. Now, we could go in and create constants on it and all that to kind of clean it up so we're not, but that's not, um, that's, that's not, um, that's sort of beyond where we are at this point. So, I do pretty much the same thing I did before. I'm going to go in and put this on the same line so Jesse doesn't yell at me again. <laughs> There is a need to instantiate it because the compiler will complain if I don't. Because the compiler can't, the compiler isn't sophisticated enough to understand that one of these three has to be correct. And therefore, if I don't have that in there, I'm going to get a compile error because PCT might not have been initialized. Pardon me? Wouldn't matter. Wouldn't matter. So, we'll initialize it to zero now. It has a value no matter what. And the compiler is fine. All right. I am now testing arg level, arg level, arg level, and arg bill. I do the calculation and I return the result to whoever called it. Why isn't this guy referring to the spinner control and the text box? Say in is an argument, and that's a UI thing. Remember, my whole goal in this exercise is to make this code reusable, to make this code not just work in this particular situation where I have this screen all right, with these buttons and these spinner controls and text boxes and so on. But my job is to make a method that will work and do any way, any time I have a tip calculation to be done, provided I follow these rules. I give it an argument level and I give it uh, the amount of the bill. All right. This becomes a black box. Everything about the tip calculation is either passed in as an argument or is contained within the tip method itself. And when it's all done, it returns the results. So it gets to the input, does its thing, spits out the output. Is, is, is there what? I, yeah, I don't know anything like that. That would be an Eclipse thing, I would think. I'm going to wear a, I'm going to get a t-shirt for next class, I think, that says, this is not C Sharp, this is not Visual Studio. All right, just as a reminder. <laughs> all right. So now, all this method. All right. This method itself is not tied to the UI. It's not tied to that button click event. And nowhere in here do we mention about like where the data comes from. The data gets passed to it. It does its thing and returns the answer. So now what I have to do is I have to over here go and delete a whole bunch of stuff. And this is called refactoring, exactly. Tip equals what? Equals my method, calc tip. What arguments do am I going to give it? I'm going to give it 
the spinner dot. Yeah, there's your IntelliSense. Because remember, a spinner is also a view. A spinner is also a view, right? So, and a spinner is also probably a bunch of other things as well, right? So not only does it show the things that are distinct to spinner, it shows the things that are views and things that are this and things that are that and things that are that all the way up the inheritance chain. We then do comma. And what was, cost was the thingy. And it should work. All right. <laughs> exactly. Let's see if it still works. Since this is doing the exact same calculation, I should just like pretend this does. Still works, you know. But we'll actually run it. We'll actually compile it and run it. It will, for the most part, I have seen times though that I don't know if it's like a versioning thing or version of Android or of Eclipse or whatever, where it will tell me that it's already installed and I have to manually uninstall it. So, like, usually that happens if I pick up a device and I haven't done it since like last semester and I run it for some reason. I have to go in and do that. I'm not 100% sure why that is. All right, so I can right mouse here and say run Android application. Yes, I do. It, of course, doesn't recognize my device, so I have to unplug it and plug it back in. It recognizes it. I click OK. And now again, this is what I used like last week. It did it without a hitch. The first example I did, I don't know what changed, but I don't know if it was the first time I did the tip calculator or the first time I did welcome. It gave me an error and I had to go and delete it. All right. At any rate, now, I go in and calculate, it defaults to poor, and it tells me 0%. Average shows me that, and it still works. So again, functionally, this program doesn't do anything different than it did before. But I would argue that this is better, because I have freed up that code as not being linked to the UI, not being as tethered to the UI as um, it was previously. Now, as a general rule, you do not want your event handlers, your on-click listeners and, and those kind of things to have business logic in it. All right? That's just like a general rule. All right? What is going to be in there? It's going to be the glue that glues your UI to your business logic, business functions. In this case, I have um, a method. I could have another class that actually did this calculation. That's sort of like the next step in our evolution here. Is we made this code, we separated it from the UI, now I want to separate it from the activity so anyone within my application can do tip calculations, not just this one activity. Questions? so far about this. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's, ex that's exactly what I'm saying. This should be the activity. You should just do activity stuff. The business logic still shouldn't be here. It's better was before because now I can call it anywhere within the activity but I couldn't call it within another activity let's say. All right and that's what we're going to do next and we're going to try to get that done today. We have seven minutes left according to my timer. All right so we'll see if we can do this in seven minutes. 
What Jesse mentioned is it would be better still if this had its own class. All right? So it had its own component that was the tip calculator, um, um, was a tip calculator component that we could plug in wherever we want to do this calculation. All right? So we, we've improved this code a little bit because now we're not tied to that button, but we're still tied to the activity. We want to be able to do cal tip calculations regardless of where in the application we want to do this. So I'm going to go up here and I'm going to create file, new, class, all that stuff is going to be the same. Um, I am going to call my class tip. Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. So I created my new class. I'm going to actually just move that calc tip into this class. That's actually pretty easy to do. It's a cut and paste. Paste it in here. And now, all I have to do is I have to tell it where that calc tip method is. So I have to create a tip object and then call the calc tip method on the tip object. So I will say tip I don't want to say tip tip because then it won't be clear like what tip means what. All right, and I've already used T, and I don't want to go back recoding that. So I'll say tip obj equals new tip. That creates a tip object, so it creates all the methods and so on that are associated with a tip object. So now. I have to tell it where that method lives, and that method lives as part of the tip object. So I go t.calc.tip, and oh, yeah. I, I, again, I just said I'm not going to call it t, and then I use t down there. So that would be t.obj, right, calc.tip, all right. And again, it still should work. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, you're, you're right. It has advantages and disadvantages. Um, I feel obligated that we get covered at least to some degree, but again, I'm, I'm still processing setting it up and, and all that. Uh, and if you look, the code still works. I put in the values here. And do the calculation. It still goes. Again, Functionality, I didn't improve this a, a, a notch. Yet from a coding perspective, by separating it out, we've made big improvements of it. Now, these are some things, and again, these are things, you know, we're, we're working in an Android environment and in a Java environment, but the one thing I want you to realize is good programming practices are good programming practices. You wouldn't do, you know, just because you were like working in some other language, 
you wouldn't do like I did before and have the code right on the event handler. There's still some equivalent of separating the GUI with uh, the business logic. You know, in, in ASP.NET, you'd have your ASPX page and you'd have custom classes that you could create in C Sharp or, or whatever. All right, so good programming practices are good programming practices. All right. Um, now there's something specific to Android, but in addition to learning Android and learning Java, I want us to learn and practice good programming practices as well. Questions over this? Going once, twice. All right, that's all I had.